I'm Stuart Pickett, and I am a scientist and urban ecologist at Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies and director of the research project, one of whose fruits we will share today. There are two other panelists. First is Dr. Tymon McPherson. Tymon is professor of urban ecology in the New School Environment Studies program. He is founder and director of the Urban Systems Lab and research faculty at the Tishman Environment and Design Center at the New School. He is also a senior research fellow at Stockholm Resilience Center at Stockholm University and at Cary Institute <coughs> excuse me, of Ecosystem Studies. Next is Dr. Z Grabowski. Z is an interdisciplinary research associate at the Urban Systems Lab at the New School. Formerly, he was a postdoc at Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. He works at the intersection of ecological restoration, social justice, and evolving infrastructure systems. The product they will describe today is a contribution to meeting the world's urban challenge. Next slide, please. The urban challenge includes three big issues. Globally, urban areas are spreading. Second, the effects of climate change intersect with urbanization. And finally, increasingly people live in cities, suburbs, exurbs, and the wildland urban interfaces, 84% in the US and more than 50% globally. This means that the urban realm is where sustainability battles will be won or lost. Next slide. Urban ecology is a key science in helping chart a sustainable urban future. It asks how nature and ecological processes operate in urban areas. It is therefore an interdisciplinary field, social, ecological, technological, constructed, conducting research on small green areas, little slivers to the entire urban mosaic, including green and gray infrastructures. This means that green infrastructure is one of its subject areas. These are sites that support significant ecological processes, things like parks, waters, vegetation and yards, and living components of streetscapes. Next slide. Cities are socially diverse in terms of race, wealth, empowerment, and neighborhood environments. That means that access to resources, information, decision-making processes are not equally distributed across the populations of the urban realm. This leads to the question that guided our work. Do all the different populations in urban spaces have good access to green infrastructure? And if there are burdens to green infrastructure, are those concentrated in disadvantaged communities? In other words, is green infrastructure a universal good? Next slide. To answer this question, we conducted a multifaceted research project. For example, Professor Mary Kat Nasso at the University of, Davis, California, University of California, Davis, mapped green infrastructure and social equity in Baltimore, a city where Cary Institute has conducted long-term urban research. Dr. Amanda Phillips de Lucas constructed an interactive online toolkit about governing green infrastructure based on interviews with city policymakers, managers, community groups, and NGOs in Baltimore and five other cities across the US. That is the, the topic of the, the workshop that Lori mentioned coming up in February. Dr. Joanna Solins and Mary Cadenasso constructed a storyboard distilling findings from the larger project. And today we present the website summarizing insights on the equity of green infrastructure in official American city plans. Dr. McPherson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stuart. It's a pleasure to be here and to discuss this with all of you. I want to pick up uh, where Stuart actually started to introduce in terms of the project and some additional contextual uh, factors that we consider when we think about green infrastructure, equity in cities. And three things stand out for cities uh, for me. One is that they're complicated spaces 
There's a lot going on in cities, as Stuart was describing. They're also complex systems. They have complex feedbacks and dynamics. It makes them, on the one hand, exciting to study, but also difficult to plan and govern, especially as we try to do this planning, management, and policymaking work in ways that can achieve the normative goals that we have to improve equity, social, environmental justice, resilience, and sustainability. They're also contested spaces and they're full of contested spaces and green infrastructure and green spaces have been and continue to be a kind of space that's highly contested and for many reasons. Uh, one, because we've seen historically and continuing into the present patterns of inequity and who has access to these spaces and the benefits that they provide. And there's a number of ways that this has been documented in the research literature. For example, cities, researchers in cities all across the US and around the world have documented the inequity and the distribution of both green space and the benefits of green space. And here I'm showing you two maps from New York City. And what you see here in red are examples of where the supply of green space and green infrastructure in the city and the demand, the need for that space uh, by low income uh, populations and high density populations in the city where they don't match. And in green, you can see where those matches are much better. And this is just simply to illustrate that the spatial distribution of both green space and green infrastructure and the benefits that they provide in this case, looking at local temperature regulation and stormwater mitigation, these are not spatially distributed in an equitably way, equitable way. And this is true in many cities across the US, many other researchers have documented very similar patterns. So in the study that we're gonna be describing today, we wanted to start from this point and ask the question, how is planning doing and taking up these issues that have been well-documented, what's actually happening in the plans that are on the books? So to examine that, as Stuart was laying out, and I'll just provide a little more detail. We looked at 20 cities around the US. We looked at a geographic spread all across the country of small, or sorry, medium and large cities. And we looked at a wide variety of plans. And from the plans that exist, we extracted the plans that actually deal with green infrastructure in some way. And in that process, we came up with over 120 plans that are currently on the books in these 20 cities that are planning for green infrastructure in some way. And of those plans, we asked, how do they conceive of, how do they define, how do they frame green infrastructure? How do they conceive and frame and define and, and, and consider and even plan action around equity in their green infrastructure planning? And these are the two big questions that we sought to try to understand in this plan analysis. Now to do that work, meant we needed to dig in pretty deeply into those plans. That meant coding the actual text in the plans in a way that we could extract and actually then analyze for the kinds of concepts and terms and definitions and, and ways of considering green infrastructure and equity in US city planning. So in the green infrastructure concept, for example, we looked at the concepts and definitions, the way in which green infrastructure is actually defined in the plans and considered the types of green infrastructure that are considered and planned for, the many kinds of functions and the dominant functions that green infrastructure is being planned to provide and the kinds of benefits that are being ascribed to green infrastructure in those plans. And in equity, we looked at multiple dimensions of equity in the planning processes as well. One, as I mentioned, the distributional equity dimensions. How are cities in their planning efforts looking at uh, addressing distributional injustices and inequities how are they developing processes for more equitable process or procedural uh, equity in the planning uh, of GI in cities? And also, how do they envision equity? What is the vision uh, for equity in these plans? And it's worth saying up front that there's a lot of other kind of planning that's happening in cities all across the US, including in the 20 cities that we examined. Community-led plans, uh, other kinds of planning that's coming not through the formal city planning, and we do not actually cover that in this analysis. So that's good to be upfront about, but what we are looking at is what is governing municipal planning in, this, in the cities across the US. And I'm gonna hand this over to Z so he can kick off talking about how uh, this actually came about in terms of the results and really just going through the results with you of what we found. So Z, over to you. 
Uh, thanks, Timon and Stuart, and, and thanks to everyone to coming here. I see we have over 200 people attending, so I'm very excited that this is a timely and relevant topic and, and folks are showing up and, and eager to learn more. So in terms of what we found in the actual plans, uh, what in terms of what GI was, which is where we had to start, um, and I'll preface this by saying we screened a fairly large number of documents, over 360 documents that come up with this 120 um, of actual official city plans. And the way that we saw them as dealing with GI is by if they explicitly referred to the term green infrastructure. And when they did that, we saw declarative statements about what does what is GI. And ideally, it'd be a statement about what is GI, what does it do, who does it do it for. Um, for the formal definitions of green infrastructure that we found using those methods, we then classified them according to these four conceptual buckets, if you will. Um, did it pertain to a landscape planning concept similar to Benedict McMahon's original idea of planning for diverse, connected networks of ecological elements? Was it really just focused on stormwater management or regulating urban hydrology um, in line with the EPA's definition of green stormwater infrastructure, which often gets just called green infrastructure? Um, or was it really trying to integrate um, those two concepts or even more? Um, an integrated example is thinking about how transportation networks can include alternate modalities that are integrated into ecological networks, but then also manage stormwater flows. And some cities also had other concepts which didn't quite fit those definitions. Looking across all of our plans, the vast majority of definitions of green infrastructure utilized the stormwater concept. The landscape concept was still prevalent, you know, almost 20% of plans retain that original landscape ecology definition. And most interestingly to me and us, and what's in the paper that was recently published in Frontiers of Ecology and Environment, was that there is a increasing uptake of this integrated definition. I think a lot of cities um, are really trying to think more deeply about how to green existing built infrastructure systems in relation to interconnected networks of ecological elements and provide stormwater systems that comply with current federal regulations. You can see this more clearly on the next slide, um, where we kind of examine the DNA, the conceptual DNA of different plant types and across different cities. I know it's a somewhat complex figure. Um, the colors pertain to, similarly on the last slide, what concept of green infrastructure was used um, in a given definition. Going down the left side, you have the cities that we examined using their three-letter airport code. And going across the top, we have the plan type that um, we looked at. Um, you don't have to worry about all these. They're, they're in the paper and the supplementary information if you wanna dig in. Um, but the key thing that we found was that about half of our cities were showing up somewhere, had an integrative concept showing up somewhere. Um, and that's kind of outlined in the red box. The other thing was that comprehensive plans, um, which was the ones that most commonly use the green infrastructure concept out of all the plan types we examined. So even though it is a predominantly being used as a stormwater planning concept, comprehensive plans, which deal with the basic nature of the urban fabric, are really planning for GI, and they're doing so using diverse concepts. Um, on the next slide, um, we kind of dug into these definitions a little bit to see what actually counts as green infrastructure within those definitions. When we do that, um, we find that they roughly break down evenly between pretty pure ecological elements, you know, things just like trees, um, wetlands, riparian ecosystems, and more hybrid facilities, things like bioretention facilities, stormwater planters, street trees, rain gardens, um, and what have you. So these are kind of hybrid gray-green types of infrastructure. We also found a not insignificant number of things that qualify as green infrastructure within the definitions in city plans that are just materials and technologies, things like permeable pavers, um, particular types of materials being used in the built environment. Uh, on the next slide, we broke these down more specifically, this again within that Frontiers paper, um, and defined single elements as types within those definitions. And we sought um, to see if there's any real consensus or agreement between cities or plan types on what counts as GI. Again, this is a similar picture um, for, as the concepts that there's a big range in terms of how cities are considering specific things, part of their green infrastructure system. There was some consensus around trees being green and being important. Those are the most common elements. 
by retention was a close second in terms of how frequent it was frequently was referred to. But we also saw some clear gaps and sort of losers in the green infrastructure definitions, namely uh, ecological networks are not sort of robustly considered either our trails or productive landscapes. So urban agriculture systems haven't really been showing up um, as part of green infrastructure. It doesn't mean they're not being planned for, they're just not being planned for under this concept. Um, but what does green infrastructure do? On the next slide, when we looked at the functions of GI that are ascribed to it, we see it primarily as an environmental technology. Um, this means that, you know, similar to other types of environmental planning, GI is oriented around providing environmental services. In some cases, it's a subcomponent or component of technological systems, generally referring to storm and drainage and sewer systems. Um, and in some other cases, it's seen as a key part, and very rarely it's seen as a key part of, say, defining the social fabric of the city. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have diverse benefits on the, well, and when we look at the functions in more, sorry, next slide. When we look at the benefits of GI, we do see more diversity in terms of the intended benefits. So even though it's primarily an environmental service provider, the reasons why cities appear to be investing in green infrastructure is to provide largely social benefits. So almost more than half of the benefits ascribed to GI are social in nature. Um, while about a third are environmental benefits accruing to ecological systems. And not surprisingly, given the stormwater focus, a number of them are oriented around technological systems as well. On the next slide, we provide a little bit more granularity of this. I know this is fairly horrendous text, but please you know, bear with me for a second. Um, because while you can see, if you zoom in on your screen a little bit, there, there is a range of uh, benefits. The, the first word in the, on the left slide is the, the main category of benefit. The second uh, word is the subcategory. While you see a number of them pertaining to those three categories I mentioned on the last slide, um, you can also see that in the outline in the red box, the GI specific plans that are there have a very large number of specific benefits associated with GI. However, GI specific plans also have a very narrow conceptual orientation. All of the plans that we looked at that label themselves as a green infrastructure plan used a stormwater concept, except for one case where it had a sort of other concept that wasn't very clearly articulated. To me, this means that, you know, even though GI, official GI planning is primarily oriented around stormwater concepts, they're retaining a lot of the diverse benefits that were ascribed to more robust and diverse and inclusive GI systems meaning that green stormwater infrastructure plans might be overselling their social benefits. That being said, comprehensive plans were close second, and with their conceptual diversity, they, you can also see that they fill in a number of key gaps around providing social well-being, uh, spaces to gather, um, and other social services that green stormwater infrastructure plans aren't really promising. Um, and this is all important to keep in mind when we're talking about equity, uh, because when we're talking about what good does GI do, we're primarily talking about what are the benefits of GI and to whom. On the next slide, um, this is where we started to look at, you know, we, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit and say the reason we spent so much time digging into what is green infrastructure was when we started looking at plans, we found very little agreement between them in terms of what green infrastructure was. So in order to evaluate the equity of green infrastructure planning, we first had to get a very firm picture of what city plans actually meant using the term. And that's why we had to cover that diversity of definitions in such detail. With those definitions in hand, we could then ask, well, what is equitable green infrastructure? As Timon provided you the overview in terms of the different major dimensions, I'm gonna dig into each kind of element of those dimensions a little bit more detail here and, and present the results uh, of our analysis kind of on the next slide here. Um, so for the first part, in terms of envisioning equity, um, what does it actually mean? It's broken down to the definitions, the framing, and whether or not justice was addressed. Um, the green bar is basically the proportion of plans that um, exemplify current best practices in planning. The yellow or orange bar is basically those where they have a definition or they address that element, but there is caution needed in terms of how it's going to be implemented or how it could be interpreted. And red is that it's being, the, the term might be being used, equity is being used, there might be some vision, a definition, a framing, 
justice might be referred to, but it is generally done so in a problematic way. And gray, the gray area is that that element was not addressed by the plan at all. Across plans, only about 11% had a good definition of what equity means. This means that almost 90% of plans that address green infrastructure are not defining equity in a robust or defensible way in accordance with the extensive literature on the topic. About 15, 18% are doing so in a way that is you know, potentially functional, but there's caution needed in terms of how it's going to be implemented. And another sliver is doing so in ways that are obviously problematic. In terms of framing the relationship between equity and GI, cities are doing so much more diversely because they're not just using equity language. They're using diverse concepts of social benefit. And I think a lot of plans to give them credit are really trying to use green infrastructure for social good. They just aren't necessarily taking into account the diverse needs and perceptions of GI by communities or some of the concerns that many of you have even raised just in the questions that you've given us already around gentrification, the potential for displacement. Justice fares even less well than equity in terms of being defined. So I think we have an even larger way, longer way in going in terms of defining justice explicitly in green infrastructure planning, even though because of federal mandates to take into account environmental justice, as a word, justice is often used in plans, but with very little context, which is why we have this larger red bar there. On the next slide, you can see how we tried to get, or how we assessed the procedural equity of green infrastructure and planning. We did this in four key domains. Um, the first is just how are those to be impacted by plans involved in the process itself? How do the plan describe how GI policies, projects, and programs will be designed? By whom? Um, how will they be implemented? and who will evaluate them, if at all. The results of this on the, the next slide um, show some promise, but also there are some large gaps. Uh, there has been a sort of large increase in the inclusivity of planning. Um, there's a lot of different ways that cities are trying to gather public opinion at the onset of planning processes, which I think is an improvement and could be further improved. But a lot of that is also somewhat formulaic and is not very well documented. And there's a lot of claims to representativeness of city, um, city residents or communities that isn't necessarily backed up by any data. And so there is a lot of caution needed in interpreting just how inclusive um, certain planning efforts are. However, when we get to design implementation evaluation, there is a large need to evolve um, how current planning practices are you know, carried out in order to really have communities be leaders in terms of designing, implementing, and evaluating how well these programs work. On the next slide, you'll see the, the way that we um, define distributional disparities. Similar to Stewart and Timon's framings right earlier, we really wanted to see you know, how are planners taking into account the value or the goods provided by green infrastructure? Um, how do they frame and take into account and plan for the sort of uneven landscape of hazard and how GI will address that? You know, either those are human produced or environmental hazards or the intersection between environmental and human produced hazards. And in a somewhat novel way, um, and this also addresses some of the concerns around GI, is that whose labor is going to be used to realize GI all throughout the planning process, but also implementing and maintaining it. And how are they going to be compensated? The results of this um, on the next slide also show some promise. I think there's been cities are fairly consistent in terms of recognizing that GI intersects with distributional equity um, and that it does rearrange the landscape of what's valuable in the urban system as well as where hazards take place. And that's not that surprising because that's often the intended purpose of GI is to provide amenity value or to mitigate particular risks. However, when we talk about the social equity and the potential impacts of that, um, very few plans, again, about 10, 15% of these are taking into account potential negative impacts, though we do see an uptick, an uptick in plans discussing displacement, um, but there are very few strategies articulated to actually do anything about it. So those are the current best practices, are acknowledging that there are potential downsides to adding value without having mechanisms in place to prevent potential unintended consequences. Um, there is still a very large need to take into account the, how different communities might value different types of GI. Um, and the, particularly in terms of labor, there is often an inf, um, a focus on including communities in the long-term maintenance of green infrastructure, 
but not necessarily a plan to compensate them. So, and we've seen this in the literature as well, where there is kind of an, an unspoken or often even explicit demand for communities to provide the labor for GI without having a plan for compensating them, which is unlike many other public infrastructure systems in cities in the US and beyond. So what do we um, propose to sort of do about this? On the, I think there's a lot of avenues for, for potential um, improvement. Um, the first recommendation that we have is that when we think about green infrastructure, we do need to think very broadly. We need inclusive and integrated green infrastructure. Just as I was saying at the onset, you know, green infrastructure incorporates both that landscape ecology concept, planning for diverse, vibrant, functional ecological networks, as well as, you know, sort of sustainable and well-designed stormwater and drainage systems. But it also includes things like alternative transit, green energy, healthy building materials, and just improving the overall health of the built environment, which intersects with current demands for economic transitions around climate justice, and the green economy, the circular economy, the bioeconomy, and the overall just transition. So there's a lot of opportunities there, I think, to, to think more broadly and collaborate between sectors around providing ecological value through evolving infrastructure systems. The second big recommendation is the need to really dig into what equity means in an urban planning context. Fortunately, I think, you know, this analysis was basically focused on plans, official city plans that were current as of summer 2019. Um, already, I've seen plans come out since then that are much more focused on equity. Um, I think the national conversation around equity and the need for social and environmental justice has started to really change. Urban planning takes place. And so I hope if we were able to repeat this study, say in five, 10 years, these re results will be significantly different. In that time, I'm hoping what the type of framework that we provided for thinking through what equity means in a planning context can really start to provide planners and community groups a sort of more common language for thinking about how to define and operationalize equity within their specific contexts and how to change institutions, transform institutions, so communities are the ones that are sort of in charge of the decisions that impact their well being and futures. Our third major recommendation um, is very related to that, but that is kind of more detailed around planning itself, where we need more democratic planning cycles. So while we have seen that uptick, uptick in inclusive planning, we need much more um, resources put into community-based mechanisms for implementing, for designing, implementing, and evaluating the effects of GI programs. And this hopefully should get us some of those um, displacement issues. In particular, if we think about you know, how we can compensate communities for more specialized forms of labor um, around the design, implementation, evaluation, we can start to connect you know, entrepreneurs, small businesses, other community actors with the you know, wealth building opportunities that these types of larger systemic infrastructure transformations entail. So, and to that end, we've also provided our, this website as a resource. Um, on the next slide, I can, you know, I'll give you a little bit of rundown on this. I know we, we want to leave plenty of time for, for questions and, and some discussion here. Um, so I'll move through this somewhat quickly, but the, the website provides three big things. You know, it, it kind of has many of the resources that I've referenced here. Um, it has our general framework, our methods, the synthesized results at the national scale, and it has our city specific pages. And so on the, we can go walk through that pretty quickly. If we, on the next slide, you can see the overall context. I know Time and the Steward gave us a, a nice summation of the, the complexity of urban challenges, uh, but we also wanted to kind of identify six big dynamics that cities um, are you know, addressing to various degrees and they're talking about ecological and social justice. Um, the sort of six big buckets we had here, and there's resources on the website for further reading for um, and all of these. And so we're not, you know, we're just basically providing signposts to other authors and other groups who worked on this um, for a long time, because these are long running issues. But what we really need to be focused on, when we're talking about equity and green infrastructure, is the need to remember that, you know, we need to center this sort of ecological genocide that has made many cities possible um, and prevent the erasure of indigenous peoples, relationships with land and modes of governance, and really focus on restorative governance and not just, you know, acknowledging that these are historical um, issues. Similarly, segregation, we need to recognize that segregation is embedded in many US cities. Um, the sort of, there's a form of systemic racism that operates to this day and will likely continue to operate unless we address it explicitly. Um, this intersects with legacies of dispossession 
um, as well as the ongoing dynamics of economic um, and material dispossession that urban planning has historically sort of enabled, and if we're not careful, will continue to enable. And somewhat um, specific to environmental justice and climate adaptation, we see that the efforts to, to adapt to climate change and to mitigate environmental harms also have very uneven social consequences. That in itself is often related to um, marginalization. So as Stuart was talking about, we have these explicit processes that exclude uh, people from political and economic systems that are required to have decision-making power in the current political systems that we live in. However, in the wake, in the face of this, um, we see ongoing forms of resistance and reimagining alternative futures through continued self-organization by these impacted communities. So while we didn't analyze community-led planning efforts themselves, we were more interested in how they sort of percolate into official city planning processes. That is an area to think of right, not just research, but really kind of knowledge to action. Um, on the next slide, um, I'll, this is basically a really brief overview of how to interpret some of these city level figures. I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions from folks who work in these cities, um, and we're happy to have an ongoing dialogue on how this type of information can be useful. Um, I've personally traveled around the US for, for many years, and I've been in all of these cities, but I'm not an expert on, on any single one of them, though I do have lived in Portland and Washington, DC, and I'm very familiar with New York. Um, so there's always a, a little bit of a danger in terms of doing this research from afar. So I, we don't want you to interpret these results as totalizing or the, the overall narrative about the equity of green infrastructure in this planning. This was simply one tool used to analyze the equity of a planning system. It could be applied elsewhere. And we're really hoping that it, it sheds some insight and, and sort of stimulates a dialogue about how to do this better. But when you're looking at the city specific pages on giequity.org, what you'll find is essentially a brief context um, sort of a, a, nutshell, a history of the city in a, in a very um, brief nutshell why it's different from other cities we examined. Uh, we do present the definitions of green infrastructure, you know, according to those concepts, types, functions, and benefits that I covered that we found in the, the plans that we uncovered in each city, as well as the plan level results of the applying our equity scoring matrix to it. And so when you look at the, the figures in there, you see the sort of scores for envisioning, the procedural equity and the distributional equity ranked according to those levels I presented. And we also do provide city specific kind of suggested recommendations based on our interpretation of these results. And I think that's an area for, for key, a key area for further discussion with folks who are on the ground and we really kind of welcome opportunities to do so. Um, on the next slide, uh, this is basically what I'm leading at is that you know we've we've done this work so far we've we've dug into current official plans, uh, but we know there's a lot more to do. Um, cities are complex, green infrastructure is complex, governing GI is extremely complex, and we really you know would be interested in how this sort of grassroots um, and bottom up quote unquote bottom up led initiatives that have been for a long time in advocating for equitable GI either make it into you know, formal institutional processes around planning and allocating public resources to green infrastructure or don't? What are the hurdles to you know, making many of the demands and the visions that have come out of communities themselves? What are the hurdles to making those official city policy? And given that you know, many of the, the challenges cities are facing are, are complex in scale, not just in scope, you know, flooding is operating at a regional level. Climate change is a global problem. At what scale can you know, communities be organized you know, singly and together collaboratively to really address these things um, to kind of mobilize that larger scale regional concept of green infrastructure? And ultimately, we're also interested in, you know, we analyze these plans, but what's the reality on the ground? How is green infrastructure um, manifesting in these different cities? Is it in accordance with these plans? Where are things going well and where are they not? So that's, that's most of it. On the last slide, we. Um, I want to just make sure I thank the, the larger research team and folks that made this possible. We had a lot of excellent minds, um, not just put into the plan analysis, but really in trying to communicate these results in an accessible way to folks who are trying to use this information on the ground to advocate for equitable green infrastructure in their home cities and beyond. Um, and I also want to thank you all for, for being here and I also wanted to thank the JPB Foundation for their generous support that made this project possible. Um, with that, I'll wrap it up and hopefully have time for a good Q&A. We please, like I see some folks have been putting um, questions in the Q&A. If others haven't yet, um, please weigh in there. And that is where we will 
do our best to respond to them. So thank you all once again. Thank you, Z, for the, the detailed walkthrough. Thank you, Timon, for the, the contextualization. And we've been collecting the, the questions from the Q&A box. If you, haven't, um, if you have questions which you haven't put in there, please do so. That will be the best way to get them in our hands. I see some questions. Let's start with um, perhaps questions about how cities and plans were selected. That seems to be a good, good place to start. Um, that's two on my list, by the way, Z, if you're looking at that. How were the cities selected? Was political influence considered? What determined if a GI plan was included or not included in our analysis? And is there a database of the plans? I can take that, I'm sure. Yeah, so we did, um, there was a lot of thought that went into city selection. Uh, we know that some cities are recognized as green infrastructure leaders, cities like Portland, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, um, Seattle to some extent. And we really wanted to see, you know, people who have been described as being the forefront of GI, what was in their planning documents, which led to a lot of work for us and our team, but it was, it was a welcome challenge. Um, the, uh, in terms of what if a GI plan was included or not, uh, I think that we had four big criteria, and that was, was it a city-led document? Basically, was it some sort of binding document signed off on by city government or a city agency um, or city council? Uh, was it current? Um, was it an actual, was a plan that was, you know, being implemented that was approved that excluded a bunch of plans that we had found that were historical that had been current and now had been replaced or updated by a newer version of the plan. Um, and yeah, was the focus really on in terms of did it address green infrastructure, as I kind of briefly mentioned, was it, did it really use the term green infrastructure and it did it do so in a fairly substantial way? Uh, and I saw another question very closely related to in the Q&A about um, single projects. We didn't dig into very project level plans. A lot of plans contain project lists. And that is something that, as I mentioned, we'd like to see which ones are actually implemented. But given the uncertainty around them being implemented or not, we really focused on the larger planning areas. This meant that this doesn't just mean that we focused on citywide plans. We also looked at a number of neighborhood plans. Um, and in response to the database question, yes, there is a database. Uh, it is associated with that Frontiers article, which we can probably put a link to in the, in the chat, um, which has uh, hyperlinks to every single one of the plans that we examined. And we'd also be willing to share, I think, a, a database that has all of the documents we screened, uh, including the ones that didn't make it um, because they didn't meet our criteria. Yeah, and thanks, Z. And just to add to that, um, I think Lori did put a link to the paper in the chat. And as Great. you mentioned, um, supplementary info is things people don't know they should read, but it's usually where you can find a lot of other information. So it's good to point that out. But I just wanted to mention that the, the starting point for this was really trying to ask a question at a national scale and trying to get a sense of the pulse of how equity is being addressed in green infrastructure planning in the US. So the choosing of cities and the selection was not that question about was there political influence, it was more about a spread of trying to get a sense of where we are in the planning process and in planning systems in terms of addressing equity and GI planning across the US. Of course, that led, led us down a lot of rabbit holes to try to understand this in um, more granularity in each of the cities, but just kind of set that context in terms of where we started from was to try to get a sense of the sort of national scale and the national approach to this. And then of course, it's quite varied as, as you've seen. Great, thanks. There are some a, a number of questions that revolve around the issue of quote green uh, gentrification or displacement. So we have a question that sort of summarizes several of those. Hope that, to do that justice by the summary. How do you balance the role of green infrastructure that the role green infrastructure plays in gentrification? when implemented in urban areas for urban resilience. What do you think? Who would like to, to take that? I can start with that. Um, and, and see, I'm, I know you have thoughts about this. And Stuart, I know you do too. Um, I think one of them, Z started to cover, and I believe is the second recommendation, which is thinking about um, more inclusive concepts and even framings around how we 
both plan for GI and implement GI in neighborhoods. And one of the ways to think about this is to think about putting the emphasis on GI investments and various ways of planning and inciting and implementing GI together with other approaches that are needed to address gentrification concerns. For example, uh, putting funds and resources into GI investments that are alongside uh, low-income housing subsidies or even building more housing in a lot of our cities that just have inadequate housing and especially inadequate access to affordable housing. Z, you touched on this some too in terms of um, bringing in the sort of the jobs and even the economic benefits associated with GI in ways that we can be addressing with uh, the this not only disproportionate um, access to GI, but where it's being cited and the location being cited, bundling that with other ways of addressing issues that tend to cause displacement by bringing the community not only into the planning process, but into the benefit process that, that includes economic benefits. So I think there's a range of both how communities can be involved in ways that limit or even uh, hopefully destroy the kind of displacement and patterns that can happen with certain kinds of uh, investments in green space and green infrastructure, but also coupling that with other infrastructure investments that are vitally needed so that green infrastructure is not some kind of standalone solution and ignoring everything else that actually we know we have to be investing in green infrastructure because it has a lot of benefits. But at the same time, we need to be investing in housing and jobs and economic security and food security and energy security in neighborhoods that are dealing with all of those problems simultaneously. I'll, Stuart, if you had opinions, please hop in or. No, you go first. Okay, I, yeah, I, I basically second what, what Tom is saying. And I think there is a, a real need to, we, we want to, when we look at this issue of green gentrification, I think it's, we tend to just look at the green part and we're kind of ignoring the larger structural factors that are leading to gentrification. And if green infrastructure isn't gonna be the cause, if it's gonna be the cause of gentrification, it's usually because it's happening in a very uneven way where it's targeting particular areas to, for improvement without necessarily their consent and without having an overall citywide level of improvement. So certain areas become much more desirable all of a sudden uh, where previously they were seen as undesirable for large scale investment in housing or, or retail or commercial activity. I think those types of structural factors are gonna be very difficult to address just through green, green infrastructure planning itself. These are like deep uh, problems in sort of municipal policy and federal policy around housing investment. And hopefully some of that's being addressed at higher levels around providing, you know, the type of larger economic transitions that we've, we've nodded to, where you really do need a, a just transition to lift communities out of, you know, forms of poverty that have come out of years and years of systemic disinvestment and restructuring, say, federal level tax codes. So the gentrification is probably not just being caused by green elements in the cases where it is. Yes, we can do it differently. And I think that's Focus, that requires focusing on citywide networks of, of GI, so it's not just like a, a fetishized commodity, and it's done in the, accordance with the needs of those different communities and done in different ways in different communities, but also we need to address these larger um, systemic and structural racist issues in, in our society. This and, is such uh, a huge topic. I think yeah. I, I think we should spend maybe another minute on it, which is just to say that some of those structural issues, there's many and we should name some of them, um, which is if if you're concerned about um, green gentrification, then what you're saying, Z, I'm also reading, and sort of my own approach to this is to think that this means we have to think about the zoning changes that are happening in the city, right? We have to think about the kinds of pressures that need to put, be put on development and development projects and developers, and whether that's including low-income housing as part of uh, every development project that cities uh, take on or other ways of bringing in ways to address displacement and gentrification. Because again, it's a comp complicated thing that causes gentrification and there's many pieces and if you if we really want to be addressing this demonizing green infrastructure isn't going to be the solution even though in some cases it may be the leading edge of what is driving in some areas but we also know that upzoning and other mechanisms that are being used to displace residents uh, are where we have to also be battling simultaneously Thanks. I've been talking about this a long time. <laughs> yeah, I, I will resist the 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 uh, urge to to add very much to that, other than to say that both both Tyman and and Z have given a sense of some of the complexity of the structural things that that allow 
quote green gentrification to go on, but one of the things that, that I find uh, very troubling in the way that often gentrification is talked about, it's talked about as just something that's automatic. It's just what the market does. It's just the, the logic of the market. And some of the, many of the things that they have um, pointed to indicate that this is, is not just, it's not inevitable. Okay, um, here's another question. Let's see here. Some, this, some folks have been interested to know, are there particularly good examples of plans that integrate equity into GI planning that we can look to? And, and perhaps um, the, I think the website does give a, an entry into that. So I'll let you all say more about that. Yeah, it's always dangerous when you start picking winners and these types of things, but uh, some just off the top of my head, you know, and the, the city level pages, you can really identify plans that have different elements and you can, you know, follow those plans and dig into the, the pieces that we found that were working well. Uh, but I, Atlanta's newest green infrastructure plan is one of the few that really tries to address this issue of green gentrification. And while it doesn't lay out a process for really doing it, it at least says it's a, an area of real concern and the city government is saying they're committed to working with communities to identify strategies to prevent displacement. So while it's not perfect in terms of laying out how we should do that, and I put a couple links in the chat for, for other projects that are working specifically on the green gentrification bit, it at least is upfront about the need to work with communities to address these types of challenge. Portland's climate plan um, is another one that really has very diverse framings of equity. Um, and that's, that's one that I think people can really look at in terms of getting the, the conceptual, you know, um, architecture for how equity could be addressed. Uh, but then again, I think the real challenge is, is operationalizing this. And I think there might be actually a lot more knowledge in community groups who have been working on like real grassroots level community plan on how to do this than is in city departments. So I think we have a, you know, to kind of turn the question around on the audience a little bit, I think there's a real need for the type of expertise in community-led planning processes to inform how cities need to address these issues. So it's it just, it's not really there per se in city plans yet, but I think it's there in, in other plans that we didn't look at, but that we are formally through this, but we are aware of um, through, especially some of the feedback we've already received from folks on this. And one of the things we're, trying to create a mechanism for uh, is also to gather up some of these examples of best practices that may be coming from more community-led uh, planning efforts, ones of which you know we know about but weren't part of uh, this analysis and haven't really been incorporated into the website. So again, as Z said, we we are looking to to learn more ourselves and be able to uh, hopefully be a better mechanism of providing out some of those best practices and examples that um, we might might even exemplify some of the kinds of solutions that everyone is looking for. Great, thanks. One of the things to say about this website is that it is a rich array of tools that would allow users to go in, open the hood, and, and make those kinds of judgments for, for themselves. You don't have to trust us for ranking cities. We've tried to give you a, a set of information that, that you can do to sort these sorts of things out and come to your own judgments. We um, Let me change gears a little bit and we've had some interest that can be summarized in this question. Did you notice any national or international movements or networks that were influential to getting best equity practices in these plans? And were there any historical or economic or political similarities between cities with similar plan characteristics? That's the two questions. We'll hit the first one first maybe. Movements or networks. Um, so briefly, I do see like the U.S. Sustainability Directors Network mentioned in a number of places, um, particularly in resilience planning. Um, I see a lot of best practices kind of being disseminated there. And I also saw evidence of you know, basically peer-to-peer -peer learning. So cities are, and many of you all probably know this, the cities are actively looking at each other and their peer cities and seeing what's showing up in their plans. And a lot of cities reference other planning efforts in other cities when they're talking about best practices. So I think we all kind of need to evolve together. Um, and I do see some um, influence of the Green Infrastructure Leadership Exchange, which has um, shown up in the questions in a number of different places. And we are actively uh, engaged with them in time to disseminate the results of this knowledge and think proactively about how to evolve uh, these green infrastructure planning systems to be more equitable. Um, and I'd love to throw on the other question. 
Well, I'll pick up on the first one just briefly and say I was thinking of um, USDN as well, and I put a link in the chat for people who aren't familiar with them. They've been working, you know, behind the scenes in a lot of ways with communities, but directly with cities to bring equity into GI planning. Um, there's also a really incredible group of actors, uh, you know, community organizers and organizations um, that's represented broadly in the Climate Resilient and Equitable Water Systems Network, uh, which is supported by the Kresge Foundation. And in that, you mentioned the Green uh, Infrastructure Leadership Exchange. They're part of that network. Um, the Southeast Direct, uh, Sustainability Directors Network is part of that network. And there's a whole amazing network of people sharing best practices helping navigate uh, difficult political situations, thinking about how to get funding, helping each other even write, say, for example, BRIC applications to FEMA to bring funds into their neighborhoods and to do that in a way uh, that's community led. So there are multiple resources out there, I think, where people on the ground have learned from each other and are providing more. And we'll, we'll try to point to uh, more of these organizations as well. But I think that that would be another network of organizations that would be excellent to get in touch with and, and to find more about if you're interested. Okay, the, we're unfortunately headed to a, a, just a handful of minutes left and there are many, many more questions. And so um, it's, it's difficult for me to choose. Let me hit one that that actually uh, my little preface to this question is that uh, the project as a whole you're seeing a part of the project today and we've had um, other parts of the project that have dealt with um, say on the ground field trips with community folks and city agency folks we have had conversations with with some of the cities, with um, either officials and, and have followed those threads from uh, community leaders, community groups back and forth with city agencies and whatnot. So there's, there's been more than just the sort of analytical approach that you see here. And <clears throat> so one of the things that is asked is um, how did we engage city departments and practitioners and how we, would follow up to ensure usable science. And so that maybe is something that we can end with to, to point us a little bit in the future. So what do you think? Yeah, sure, no, I think that's a great question. I'm, I'm very happy that a number of different folks from cities that we've been working in have, have reached out to us. I think we've gained a lot of, of knowledge from there. I think we also tried to, um, in our initial approach, provide a fairly agnostic and reproducible approach that could be replicated in any city. Um, so we started with like, a con if, avail if it was available, a sustainability plan, if not a climate plan, and if not a comprehensive plan to see if green infrastructure is being planned for in that city at all. So while we focused on this stage on basically a reproducible document analysis method, I think it is important to build those relationships with city agencies and community groups over time. And that's why we're hosting this webinar. So I think we've kind of come to it at this point where we've done a lot of work kind of, you know, in our you know, sort of academic space, we've had some engagement with folks and, and now we're ready for, for a lot more and involving this project. But it's, it is a vital part of doing this type of work. I think that's a great place to leave it. Thanks, Z. And, you know, just to say that we have our own relationships in particular cities, but not in all 20 cities and all the very planning uh, uh, levels that are happening in those cities. Um, but hopefully there's, massive interest in this and even just um, the audience on this call I know has deep expertise in various places and hopefully this can be a source of networking to mobilize more efforts uh, in connecting up with where decision making is happening and as I saw on the chat examples from new planning in Seattle ways to sort of not not only just bridge the divide but start to dissolve the divide between community planning and formal city planning so that you know we can deal with both the procedural aspects in ways that can address the other aspects and dimensions of equity that need to be dealt with to really enable green infrastructure to be an amenity for everyone. Thanks for Cary Institute for hosting us. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and um, please do give us feedback. I don't know if, see if you mentioned it. There is a comment function on the website. Uh, we will be monitoring and I'm doing our best to follow up. Thank you. Thanks everybody for attending. And I really appreciate the contributions of the questions, the the suggestions that people have 
put in the, the chat for networking and very much appreciate that and look forward to following up. So hopefully the website is useful to folks and our continuing interest in networking with this larger community we hope to pursue. So thanks everybody. Have a, a, a great rest of your day and really appreciate your, your participation. It's been very exciting for us. All right. Goodbye. Thanks everyone.